Hello and welcome back to the second messiah. On the last episode, Vithericus overcame the last major obstacle on his journey south, the kingdom of Nabatia, so had an open run towards the source of the Nile through the open desert. Saffrax laid siege to Tarentum, trapping the first Roman legion inside. That legion decided to sally out and try its luck on a field battle. Unfortunately for them, Saffrax had an ideal position and charged out his heavy troops, ruining the enemy's infantry, and their poor use of their reinforcements allowed their army to be totally wiped out. Phthericus and the stewards of the Divine made it to the source of the Nile, and there they encamped and began their search for the second messiah. The search went on for a whole year, during which time Saffrax was able to storm and capture Tarentum. Eventually, Bithericus returned from his search, walking back from the desert to rejoin his tribe, now claiming to have a message from God about what they must do next. My people, my children, one year ago I left you. I left you to seek out our salvation, and for one year I thought I would return empty-handed. But, brave souls, our faith and dedication to the Lord was recognized, and God has chosen us to fulfill his will. You will all be aware that when I returned from the source, I returned alone. When God first spoke to me three days ago, the fact he did not speak of the second Messiah brought me great confusion. But by the end of his message, he had made himself clear. He never intended to send us a messiah, as he did with Lord Jesus Christ. This time he sought to create a messiah out of one who already had the power to enact his will. That was the true meaning behind the prophecy of Mercurinus. The new messiah stands and speaks before you now, bringing you the will of the Lord straight from his mouth. For he has given us a great mission, a mission that, if we fail, will doom the world, but if we succeed, will start the world anew. God has seen how the world is changing, and has realized, for the second time, that it cannot be saved from sin. He does not want to give the world we knew a second chance, but for his faithful subjects, you people before me now, and all those who walk in his light, he is willing to extend mercy. The reason for his apparent weakness over these last decades is that God has been gathering power, gathering strength for a mighty act that will rend the world apart. The land of the great desert, containing the source of all water, will be removed from the diseased lands by which it is only briefly linked, at which point it shall move away entirely, travelling into the great outer sea until no vestige of the old world can be smelt, sounded or seen. He will turn the desert into an endless paradise for we chosen few, and abandon the children who have failed him so many times to fester in the pit of sewage they have dug for themselves. I have asked so much of you already, and now I ask more in God's name, knowing that you will not hesitate to follow your Creator's will, for the sake of your souls and your families. We must all make the lands that God wishes to save ours and ensure that any tribe, kingdom or empire whose people still walk on our lands whisper the graces of God between each step. There will be much hardship, much toil and much bloodshed, no doubt. But God and I know that only you, the proven peoples of Christ, have the power to achieve this goal. Walk now, sons and daughters of the Lord, warriors and shield maidens of Phthericus, to bring about the paradise of Revelation, the second, greater Eden, the vestibule of humanity's salvation. Welcome back. We're currently rejoining Saffrax, where he has just successfully captured Tarentum, or at least defeated them in a siege assault. You can see he was aided by an army sent by our Dacian allies over from the east, and also by some scraps of forces from the Huns who were raiding in the area and decided to take part in the battle. So now he must decide what to do. It must be a difficult decision to make whether to just take the wealth of Tarentum and move on as he's always done with all of the Roman settlements, or to finally make a stand against the many enemies of reason here in Tarentum, and that is in the end what he decides to do. The Goths have settled, this ends our migration mode and puts us in a bit of a state. You can see Tarentum is highly damaged, we're very low on food, 
basically in the middle of a massive famine right now taking this territory made worse by the fact that the huns their horde which is raiding is taking most of the food from the region interestingly we can recruit roman units here this is a trait of the ostrogoths so perhaps we'll get to use that later but in the short term we basically just need to sort things out Luckily, all of my new people gave the city so much growth that I can just expand the city and start building new farmlands to help resolve the food situation. There's also a big squalor problem as well. The industry and the general Roman buildings in the area are causing a lot of squalor, so we'll have to sort that out in the long term. I'm going to destroy uh, these uh, supply buildings, which we aren't going to be able to use, and I'm going to repair the fishing jetties, which, in tandem with the new farms I'm building, should get the food situation close to zero. If the Huns leave, it will definitely be resolved. After taking the city, it seems Safrax is having second thoughts about trusting Eutheric, our Roman companion. He now despises the treacherous Romans. So uh, perhaps he is not seeking so much to emulate the Romans in creating a new empire, but to destroy them. We'll see where we go from here. So we've got confirmation there that the Horde has officially settled. We're definitely not in Horde mode anymore. And that means Vithericus's army is no longer encamped. It's now just a military force standing at the source of the Nile. Vithericus, as we heard, has a brand new mission from the Lord on High, which is to capture uh, all of the African provinces. The Lord's plan is to separate what we now know as Africa away from the mainland of the rest of Europe to create a new world free from the horrible sin of the rest. So you can see we've got a number of regions we'll need to capture in order to do that here. And the first one, Axum right next to us, is going to be a challenging one. We saw just a moment ago that Amalric, our spy, is currently checking out Axum's forces in the area. They have a full stack in their massive city just to the east of where Vithericus is. Now I could walk right across the desert to get towards them but I would suffer attrition so what I'll need to do is move back up the Nile and find a place where I can safely move onto the road. Since I'm not going to be attacked during this journey I can use Force March to get uh, more movement points so I can get closer this turn. So I get back to the road without suffering attrition, I can now travel down the road towards Axum's capital. I'm still not at war with them but this must look very suspicious so there is a danger they'll come out and fight me. So my plan is going to be to settle Vithericus's people here in Axum and then begin our conquest of the rest of Africa. Since I'm now an official faction, I can start trading with other factions. And I've made so many friends and allies whilst moving through the world that I found it very easy to set up a large number of trade deals and get loads of money uh, in the deals thrown in. So you can see here, I'm now trading with a big bunch of the allies I've made and I'm making a nice bit of money. Not alleviating the financial crisis, we're still hemorrhaging money at the moment so we are going to need to do something more in order to get our cash flowing. But perhaps once Tarentum is back up to snuff, that won't be such a problem. You can see it asked me to appoint a provincial governor here in Tarentum to Magna Gratia, the province it's in. And who better than Euthric? I thought that Euthric uh, probably forced his way to become the governor of this area. And perhaps that was why Safrax became particularly angry about the treacherous Romans seeing Euthric's true motivations and gaining power for himself. We're now in the next turn. You can see the food situation is better, still not that good. The Huns are still here. If they leave, things will be a lot better because my farm will complete next turn. I've also freed up a building slot and in there I can build the granary. This both gives me extra food and perhaps more importantly gives me some sanitation because Tarentum is a very unsanitary location. So that'll start me towards getting that uh, resolved and reducing the chance of disease. I'll also be able to eventually uh, convert the Roman marketplace into a Germanic uh, meeting hall, which will both get rid of a squalor penalty and allow me to start recruiting higher tier units. Also recruit, uh, re rebuilding sorry, the city at some point will slightly improve the squalor, which I want to do, but it costs a lot of money. Right now I need to save money, but I've got a couple of turns of money left. So I thought to extend the amount of time I have before I need to break even, I'm going to reduce the size of Safrax's army, especially because he's not at war with anyone around here. The chance of him actually fighting a battle in the near future is low, so I'll reduce the size of the standing force. Now back with Vithericus, he can continue his journey, he's got enough movement points even without the Force March to reach the Axum's capital right away, so I can attack them immediately if I want to. The question was what uh, the deal was with their other settlement there to the east. I didn't know whether they had any more forces and wanted to consider that before declaring war. 
Luckily, I've got a Malaric here, who is uh, scoping out Axum itself. He is going to be able to just go around and take a look. I wanted to actually find out first if a Malaric could do anything useful as an agent action against this enemy army before I attack. All he can do, though, is misdirect, reducing its movement points, which is terribly unhelpful for a siege attack. So I'm going to move him around to take a look. We discover that Axum do seem to have a uh, one unit arm here which they may build up once the war starts with mercenaries and they have a decent fleet sitting in port which right now isn't a threat to me. So overall nothing particularly surprising or threatening so it's time to make our declaration of war so we can advance on them. They don't really have any diplomatic relations, just trade with the Nabataeans to the north, so nothing to worry about there. We can move right in and begin a siege of their capital city. When the siege starts, we see that it's a fairly balanced battle. The enemy have a slight advantage, perhaps. So this is a case where I'm going to want to prolong the siege, build siege weapons and reduce the enemy's defenses and the number of their troops inside before I attack, because it would be very deadly and dangerous to attack right now. The risk of this, though, is that the enemy will build reinforcements using their other army and bring them over to engage in battle. But even if they do that, that's uh, favorable to a dangerous siege assault. So I'm going to sit here, build we siege weapons, and we'll see how the situation develops. It's steady progress. The position of the new walls has been plotted. Most of the homes that were damaged are still in need of repair, which, if the money can be spared for craftsmen, we would do well to deal with before the people become unruly. Although that said, the streets themselves are calm for now. The Romans here seem to honestly appreciate that we have given them a Roman governor. Our own people do not feel the same, but for now there are great concerns. There is little love between our kin and Romans, but things are getting better. More and more tents go down and new homes go up. We'll make a real jewel out of this place yet. And if we go a better job off it than the Romans, I think we'll see more where Eltheric came from. At the start of the next turn, we've got a report of attrition, but uh, luckily for us, the food situation has now been solved, so that will be the only turn of attrition we're going to have to see. The horde has left, and we've constructed enough buildings to get the, the food supply positive, and of course the granaries on the way, so soon it'll be even better. Still a massive squalor issue, as you can see, and the walls at Tarentum still need to be repaired properly, but uh, soon enough, the city shall be in proper order. You can see the Western Roman Empire's capital at Mediolanum is enjoying a uh, lot of visitors right now. We've got all sorts of uh, clans, of kingdoms, and mini empires all vying for power in this area. Northern Italy is really chaotic. We've got separatists and we've got Scots. Basically up there, things are crazy. Down here, things are a bit nicer. And Syracuse, down the coast from me, me sorry, is the ideal next target if Safrax wants to conquer a new region because it's part of Magna Graecia and is likely uh, pretty much unoccupied. Unfortunately, I can't go on any military expeditions right now because moving Safrax and his men out of the town causes such a stir to the public order that really he has to stay around just to be anywhere near a stable situation. So, unfortunately, that military campaign will have to wait. Now, moving through the end turn sequence, the forces at Axum are reinforced. It seems the prince of their kingdom has appeared with a small army. It kind of looks on the campaign map like it's just him or one or two units there, but he's managed to muster up about five or so units in his army. Plus, the garrison from the town is going to come out to help out as well. The balance bar hasn't really shifted since we last saw it, so perhaps the arrival of these reinforcements doesn't matter so much, uh, especially because now we're going to fight a field battle rather than a siege attack, which will make things much easier for us. So let's get into the battle. The terrain is uh, really hilly, lots of crags and cliffs all over the place. A terrain that's difficult for cavalry maneuvers, which may help me because the enemy has a cavalry advantage. My line's pretty simple with skirmish forces in front and my warriors forming a line in the middle with the heavy spears in thick clumps on the ends of the line. I've got my medium cavalry hidden in trees way off to the extreme left flank waiting for the enemy as they make their advance. The enemy are being reinforced from up these giant hills, two groups coming down with about 10 units in total to join the 20 units currently advancing towards me. They don't wait for their reinforcements as you can see, the leading army comes straight into the attack so we're going to have to face waves of enemies in this battle, much better than facing them all at once. First they're doing cavalry attacks, they're going to send their horsemen and camel riders forward to engage my line. These skirmishers come up to throw javelins at my men but of course I can throw right back my javelin is, take out a bunch of the enemy and drive them away quite quickly. 
Towards the center, the enemy are making similar cavalry attacks, and I'm just showering the enemy with javelins from my gothic warriors. You can see the enemy's cavalry charge is being completely decimated by these javelins. Only a couple of the men actually make it to the line, and they're very quickly going to be killed. So that's an enemy cavalry unit destroyed. Behind them comes the camels. The camels are formidable warriors in melee. They could definitely wipe through my line if they've got a really good charge. Unfortunately, they get a charge where most of their men are wiped out at the last minute by javelins. Again, just a couple of their warriors making it to the line and being destroyed immediately. So these early attacks from the enemy being wiped out, but of course, only as long as I have javelins left, which I no longer do. So now real engagement begins. Over on the left flank, the enemy are also attacking with camels, but here my spearmen are ready to try and hold them off. They've got such an advantage in terms of numbers, though, they could maneuver around them. On the extreme left, the enemy found my cavalry, and I've got some medium cav fighting with the enemy's very light cav. A fight I thought I would win, but uh, as you can probably tell, it's not going to go that way. My main body of troops is now advancing. The enemy has a massive ranged advantage with all of their hurlers, so if I just stand still, they are actually going to wipe me out. I need to go on the offensive, despite having a superior defensive position. Where my men meet enemy infantry moving forwards, they're going to quickly win, because my infantry are simply superior. The enemy have lots of desert levy, a low-level spear unit will be wiped out by the absolutely superior fighting power of the Gothic Warband. So we're going to wipe out the enemy in the center, but while we're doing it, we're being showered with missile fire, so the casualties on our side, our sides are going to rack up very quickly. The camels on the left flank are being pushed back, not routed, but they just quit the engagement. My men actually struggled to kill them. Camels aren't particularly weak against spearmen, it seems. Here in the center, you can see I've got a forgotten unit of spearmen, which is absorbing enemy missile fire. Luckily, that heavier unit is slightly more able to withstand that fire. I'm trying to deal with these skirmishers by essentially making them skirmish back out of the way using cavalry attacks, but unfortunately my cavalry attacks to the enemy's rear are being met with the enemy's cavalry, and the enemy's cavalry are just better than mine all round. So where these engagements are happening, I'm losing. You can see this unit here is uh, being readily defeated by the enemy. One unit which has got free is now successfully pushing the enemy's skirmishers out of the way, just skirmishing them all in a big column away, so my main force can now advance to hunt down easier to kill units like these desert levy. The first wave of the desert levy, as you can see, are being totally destroyed by my men as they advance. Unfortunately for my cavalry, uh, defeat has now met them, and the same thing happened to the guys on the left flank, swamped by the enemy's reinforcements cavalry we're really losing the battle out on the edges ah more of them this is it lads time to make god proud lord gylamir you have to get out of here all lives are equal before the lord i cannot let you die for my sake oh yes you bloody well can i won't let my son march in an army without you in it get out of here take ragnar's horse yours is wounded i okay Thank you. I will make sure your memories are upheld and- No time for the crap, get going. Now boys, let's put the fear of God into these sinners. Then we'll go meet the man himself and see how he rewards us. To the gates of heaven. My horsemen in the center couldn't hold out for long. If they held out just a little bit more, actually, they might have been saved by these spearmen who came in to engage the enemy's heavy cav, but unfortunately, they'd lost most of their men by then and are in a dire situation. The enemy's reinforcements are now starting to come in. More fresh units are coming to join the battle, and my messy formation isn't ideal to receive them. You can see here I'm sacrificing a spear unit to drive off five or so enemy units, making them skirmish away, but uh, doing so means they're just going to shower missiles upon those spears and likely wipe them out. The enemy have also made a cavalry attack on my rear, where I've got a single unit of archers uh, fighting in melee, attempting to hold them away from the main army. What I had to do was use the rest of my skirmishing forces to basically just rain missiles onto this melee, killing both sides. Uh, so the enemy's cavalry were defeated by that, but my own archers were destroyed in the process. Now the attacks by my spearmen are starting to drive away some of the enemy's cav and camels in the center, freeing up a little bit of space. And the enemy's general with this cav has very conveniently been trapped between two of my spear units. So now we're starting to inflict some key casualties against a unit that if it had a chance to actually charge into say my gothic warband would do extreme damage so this is a good situation three more squads of hurlers there being chased away by my gothic warband and the enemy's reinforcement infantry coming in and now starting to get engaged and where they are getting engaged they are going to be defeated because uh, as i said earlier my gothic warband are just super superior to the enemy's troops in melee you can see they're just absolutely cutting through the enemy's forces within a few seconds that unit is routed 
plenty more where that came from. So my exhausted men are going to have to keep fighting against these freshly arriving enemy troops. Luckily the enemy are probably exhausted as well, having uh, ran across the battlefield to get here. So we're going to kill them relatively easily, not taking casualties there. It's only the enemy skirmishers that will do casualties against us. And as an example of that, I wanted to focus on this moment of the battle. I had a unit of uh, skirmishers going against three enemy hurler squads, and I wanted to see how quickly they would get completely wiped out when the hurlers turned around to attack them. I hadn't actually noticed this happening during the battle itself, so you can see they were walking there. I noticed them taking losses, told them to run, and loosened up their formation, but it wasn't going to help. This unit has been totally destroyed within a few seconds by the enemy's hurler fire. Hurlers are deadly, especially against these low-level units like skirmishers. So, those guys have almost run out of ammunition, that's the good news, but they can now come back into the battle because I'm not chasing them anymore. More enemy reinforcements are arriving. In the fight, I didn't actually know about those three units of spears there because they're all hidden from my uh, line of sight, I think because of their position behind this small ridge. So you can see I'm actually ordering my men to go up onto that ridge, trying to look for enemy forces, uh, not knowing that they're actually on the ridge itself where I've ordered my men to walk. Along the rest of the battlefield, I've got plenty of troops just chasing off enemies. I knew at this point the enemy were on their last legs, but the balance bar suggested they still had plenty of forces, so I knew I had to be looking around for them. I didn't know where they were or what they were at this stage. Now those three hurler squads have actually uh, sent a unit of spears out to form a spear wall and edge towards them. Because they have their shield raised, it gives them an increased missile block chance. So this is a chance to force the enemy to waste all of their ammo, throwing their stones into a unit that won't really be killed by them. We did take a few losses, but we successfully used up all of their ammo, and that forces those hurlers to come into melee if they want to continue the fight. So I've discovered the enemy's desert levy here, and I'm now moving to uh, try and avoid getting a downhill charge from them. Luckily, the enemy missed their chance to do it. Very unenthusiastic of them. So I'm now going to move and start surrounding them with my local forces. And with any luck, I'll catch those archers there in melee that have got very close to their spear levy. So those hurlers, as I mentioned, are now coming into melee uh, because the enemy is determined to fight me, even with the disadvantage. So they've basically sacrificed themselves. The hurlers encountered this unit of Gothic Warband that was searching for enemies in the area, and they're completely annihilated in a bloodbath. And the same thing is going to happen for the rest of the hurlers over there. So I'm now making an attack on the enemy's remaining forces here in the center. The enemy got a downhill charge on some spearmen, but by exposing their rear, they were themselves downhill charged by Gothic Warband, and these Desert Levy are not going to have a very good time fighting both against my superior spears and fighting on the flank against the Gothic Warband, who are going to push through them. You can see they're absolutely slaughtering the enemy, just cutting through, getting a kill with pretty much every attack. So those Desert Levy are starting to retreat. There's two units there. One goes, the other one's going, even with most of its troops still left over. And at this point, a chain route ensues the remaining enemy forces who I was chasing uh, all of Shatter. And you can see here I'm chasing these guys with archers, but my archers just can't kill the enemy's archers because my archers are so poor. Stabbing at them, the enemy just standing still, not doing anything to resist death, but unfortunately my men are unable to kill them. Gothic Warband having a bit more luck killing the enemies there. So... We've defeated enough of the enemy in this battle to make sure that the siege situation is probably going to be a walkover. Only a close victory though because we of course took a lot of casualties winning this fight, but we are very close to having Vithericus' first city under control. They spent a year stranded in the desert. How can they muster such strength? Spy after spy reports that their people are starving barely able to collect the water they need to live each day. And yet in battle we see fiery-hearted men full of cheer. Do they even need water to live? Was the suffering our spies witnessed overturned by the power of their god? It... it can't be the case. But what other explanation is there? How could a whole tribe traverse the great desert, a most unnatural achievement, without some unnatural power to aid them? We have all heard of that master god, and we have all laughed at the prospect for so long. But this... could this be a divine punishment? So the battle is won. Only a close victory though, with extreme losses on our side. But somehow, we managed to lose only one full regiment. A lot of these regiments have absolutely no troops left, but have hung on, so eventually we can regenerate them and get them back. The enemy's army has lost the vast majority of its men. The surviving regiments are quite depleted. Not enough to end the siege right now, but next turn we may be able to take the town. 
We learn that Educa's loyalty is wavering and we gain a mission to trade with the Saxons, two pieces of business that should be easy enough to deal with. We can see here in the family tree that his loyalty is indeed very low. He's unhappy about office being given to an inferior. So I need to do something about this. I can use another member of my family to attempt to secure his loyalty. Unfortunately, he doesn't have the influence to be uh, put onto a higher position himself to allow him to get that loyalty back. So first I need to end his retainership to Safrax, and this actually increases his loyalty. I think it uh, reduces his standing in the clan not being Safrax's retainer, so perhaps he doesn't mind about these uh, other guys having positions in the, uh, the offices on the right whilst he doesn't. So that seems to have solved the problem, so I don't need to actually use anyone to secure loyalty with him, so I can just leave that at that. A strange solution, but seems to have done the job. For battle. Now you can see here I can recruit these Comet Atensis Spears, but you'll note they're actually of a slightly inferior quality to an equal costing unit, my own Spearmen, the Germanic Spearmen, who are higher tier units. So although I have the chance to recruit Roman units here, I don't think I will be because my own men seem to be superior in battle to the Romans. As for the trade with the Saxons, despite actually bordering some of their territory, not bordering their capital, means it's not going to happen a shame. So we'll see how our new empire develops and how the Therakis gets on in Axum next time. build a home for his people and Vithericus starts doing God's work on the next episode of The Second Messiah. <laughs>